So as our panelists uh, come up, this next panel I think is really exciting. Um, I, I would sort of paraphrase, this is where digital meets climate. How can data, digitization, and automation secure real decarbonization and climate action in line with a less than one and a half degrees warming world? But what is the role of big data? We have many of the big data and digital companies are extremely keen to play a role um, in this space. If we think about the big issue for this decade, we know it's about speed and scale. It's implementation at speed and scale. And there's probably four key things we have to unlock for that. We need catalytic capital. We need to accelerate the regulatory process. We need rewiring, I think, of the business relationships, the supply chains, the value chains, to realign with this new low-carbon world. And the final one, critically, I think we need the right standards and measurement and frameworks. And I think this is, this is where digital comes in. So I'd like to introduce the panel. We have a fantastic panel to address this question. Marcelo Castillo Aguerto, Head of Business Development at the NL Group. Rodrigo Fernandez, Director of ES. D and G at Bentley Systems. Michael Train, Senior Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer for Emerson. And Rebecca Branswell, CEO at the Land Life Company. If you'd like to join me on the stage, please. Please take a seat. So, I'm going to jump um, straight in. Do we have our final panelist as well? Brilliant. I'm, yes, Raquel Moses, thank you for getting here. Uh, just in time, supply chains, it's fantastic. The CEO of the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator. So, as I said, I'm going to jump straight in. Um, Marcelo, actually, I'll start with you. Um, power grids and scaling of electrification, I mean, these are key enablers of the energy transition that all countries are facing. It's critical for, for everything, that electrification process. So why are power grids so key to reaching our decarbonization targets? And how can NL contribute to the acceleration of that journey? Thank you very much for the invitation. The microphone is OK now, no? Thank you very much. I would say two things first to understand our land, our framework in NL. We serve 200 million people in distribution, 200 million, a lot. Then uh, we are the lowest cost in the world of electricity in a customer, uh, OPEX per customer, second issue. Then reducing the cost and also applying the technology I'm going to show to you, we can serve these 200 million people very well. Let me explain one. You talk about the quantum computing. Today we are saving more or less 10% in the cost of the tree cutting. Also we are saving 10% in the OPEX in the distribution operation, less obvious failures, less cost, and then it's less, obviously, uh, emission. Now, the third point that I would say is more important, I'm finished here at the introduction, thank you very much, is how we can do this with the technology. Huh? And the technology, we have everything digitalized there. For example, we have digital twin, that's a trademark of NL, that all the networks are now simulating as a virtual. So you have your body as a virtual in networks, then you can simulate storms, reduce the fires like California when they destroy a lot of, there was electricity failure in, in automation. Then digital twins is a failure. Then quantum computer, a lot of sensors. We are smart meeting. We have 75 million uh, smart meetings in the network. And finally, the less cost means less emission. Thank you. Thank you. So Rodrigo, if I could turn to you, um, how big is the investment in digital technologies taking place right now? And how big does it need to be? And how do we, how do we future-proof infrastructure? I mean, in a sense, if you think about the speed and scale required, where we are now, where we have to be even by 2030, isn't it overwhelming? Or, or, is, or is this mission possible, or is this mission impossible? Hello, everyone. OK, so uh, basically, yeah, I, I think this is kind of overwhelming some, somehow. But the point is that um, we have to, to have a, you know, uh, mixed approaches here. Uh, we, we need disruptive technologies. Uh, some of them are still being consolidated and tested, uh, being tested. 
um, that's one point. So we will not use them probably to support us in the next few years and to address net zero um, on the challenges that we have, but they will future-proof infrastructure after that in many cases. We need to, we still need, and we really uh, are needing for investments on that. But the fact is that there are some quick wins that we can, uh, low-hanging fruits that we can approach now. Um, we can leverage efficiency, circularity principles, renewable uh, energy, uh, uh, and so diversify renewable energy from several different perspectives. So basically we, we can find several examples uh, like using, um, let's think on water utilities for instance. Uh, we have examples in, in different places like Zagreb uh, or Rotterdam or even um, Manaus in Brazil where they are already using some of our tools for increasing energy efficiency, so optimizing pump energy or reducing water leakage. Uh, so they really can reduce the energy consumption by 20, 30 percent just by software uh, modeling and optimization, right? So that's, that's an example. So we cannot just be overwhelmed by the things that we really need to do uh, in innovation and, and research and technology for the future. We can already use consolidated tools, machine learning, uh, AI, the infrastructure, digital twins, uh, and efficiency uh, that can be addressed today. That's, that's, that's my perspective there. Roger, thank you. That, that's very helpful and insightful. And actually, I'm going to use that as a segue to, to Michael Emerson. So, Emerson, you did a lot of work in the industrial sectors. And that's a topic close to my heart over the last three years of building the Mission Possible Partnership and working on industrial decarbonization. And as part of that process, we've developed these high ambition industry backed net zero roadmaps to net zero for steel, shipping, cement, concrete, aviation. They give us figures, you know, not just 2050, but where you have to be 2025, 2030. Those numbers are not for the faint hearted. For example, we have to have 100 green steel plants operating at a commercial level, producing 280 million tons of green steel by 2030. So, but data and the, and the infrastructure around data um, and digital is, is a critical part of these industries now. They don't operate without it. So what are you seeing from a digitalization perspective in those industry sectors you know, that Emerson touches on? Energy, chemicals, steel, life sciences, manufacturing. Yeah, first of all, I appreciate that you're working the steel equation specifically. You know, not only do we serve the steel makers, we also buy a lot of steel for our own product yep. lines. I have my own net zero roadmap. I need, I need green steel, so thank you. I'm going to line up right behind you and hopefully you can push on that a little bit. You know, the digitalization world right now, we have, you yes. mentioned all the, the, the range of industries, right? The industrial spaces that we touch. And, you know, we've got trillions of dollars of already installed base, active, active operations. And I think the first thing digitalization is doing for us is trying to make those, if, those operations more efficient, you know, to the story that Rodrigo was just sharing with us and to what NL is trying to, to make happen as, as, as they use their digital twin, they use their simulation, try to operate those facilities better, faster, more efficient on energy and resource management as well. Uh, the other thing that's exciting in the space is, you know, as we work with uh, the steel companies, you know, they're, they're trying to look at ways to electrify and go away from the gas, first of all, right? And, and I think that's great opportunities for them. They're using measuring, they're, they're using their data, they're trying to run better. You know, the other thing we're looking at is hydrogen is coming into the picture. If you need that heat to be able to run that process, I think cement and steel and chemicals would all fall in that space. You know, we're looking at that hydrogen ecosystem to be stood up. And again, digitalization, maybe born digital, if you want to call it that, hydrogen opportunities on the generation and the use case side is going to be pretty, pretty important. So, you know, again, across the range, I think it, I've seen it in the last year, 18 months. This has really kind of filtered down into the middle of the customer's organizations, and they are really asking about this now. And, and we're having those, I think, really important dialogues at the moment. That's really helpful. And, but Raquel, I would like to bring you in here. Because a lot of the work that's going on, and certainly that I've been involved in for the last three years, the energy transition, I mean, a lot of this was built up in the industrialized world. And, you know, and there's a lot of talk around net zero industry clusters and decarbonizing those. But how do we ensure this is not just something about, you know, re you know, re-green industrialization of the industrialized world, but this is something that we do everywhere. You know, there's historic reasons why energy systems and industry clusters are where they are. It doesn't have to be the, the case for the future. So could you talk a little bit about your region and what it's doing in the context of digitization, the energy, and perhaps even the industry transition? Yeah, and thanks so much for having me. So we see um, data and digitization serving three main purposes for us. 
One in the transparency, so that we understand across the 28 countries that we cover, um, where we're trying to help partner public-private sector deals together to help the region transition to um, our climate action goals. In looking at where are countries, where are countries doing better, where are countries doing worse. For example, you see Jamaica's doing really well. We have Costa Rica that's almost 100% uh, renewable energy. We have other countries that have 100% potential for for a renewable like uh, Dominica with their geothermal, but they need investment. So it helps us to be very clear about where we are and the en energy mix that we require in order to transition. So we see data as being critical in that component. The next way that we see data, and this is gonna be counterintuitive, is we see data as a potential user of renewables. So for example, in the Dominica example, where they have geothermal, they will produce a hundred, um, a thousand percent of what they need residentially out the gate. They have six geothermal zones, and that is one of several geothermal countries in the region, and they are the first and furthest ahead. And so we are thinking about things like um, blockchain mining, and, and yes, I understand what's happening with Bitcoin right now, but blockchain can be used for so many things and we see it being applicable in climate. But using it for, for data centers and using data in that way, um, in, in, the other, in that sense. And then last, in terms of innovation, how do we use data to innovate? You know, for some of the countries that we cover, like Antigua and Barbuda and, and Anguilla, if you go to World Bank data, for example, you're seeing data as, as old as 2008, 2003. You know, so we need to, to get current data sets for everything. And this is an opportunity for us to leapfrog, um, to, to get our data systems, one, combined and working collaboratively, but two, to use that data to make better decisions about the transition. Thank you so much. Rebecca, I'd like to, to turn to you. I had the privilege of chairing a great panel this morning on nature um, and business uh, and, and, and interviewing an amazing lead, leader from, the, from Peru, um, uh, Diana, who talked about some of the projects her and her communities are involved in, in down there. But we also tackled with some of the question marks around nature-based solutions. And there is a lot of people who criticize them, don't believe they're doing you know, what they say they're doing. But we had a very robust, you know, Diana gave a very robust defense on behalf of, of local people. But it's important that we have the frameworks and the data to measure these and ensure credibility. You know, I've heard about all kinds of inventions that are coming to market, everything from mobile phones able to scan the local ecosystem to satellites to drones. Could you talk a little bit about that and get, help us make some sense of that emerging framework? It's exciting, but it's a little bit chaotic at the moment. So what are the interactions you see between data and the natural world, particularly those that help us give credibility to these critical investments in nature-based solutions? I think your, your last word there, credibility, is super important because I think when we look outside, we know that nature is part of our life and an important part of climate solutions. There's just a void of data to support it and to make it transparent. So many organizations can tell you how many trees they've planted, but not many can tell you how many trees are still alive today, let alone the ecosystem services that they're providing back to communities and back to economies. And so we've really kind of just dove into how do we collect data on all of those diff different levels that you just mentioned. You know, you're out there geotagging trees with your mobile phone, you're flying the drones with the, the LIDAR to, try to pick up a different level of data, and then satellite to understand how is this all coming together on a landscape level. And we need to really reinforce this kind of virtuous learning cycle every planting season. And we have to think also about concepts of automation, right? Due to natural climate disasters, our planting window gets smaller and smaller every year. How are we going to make natural climate infrastructure at scale in the time period that we need if we are not using insight collected from data in the field so we can do our job better and more quickly every planting season that we have? Thank you. Let's switch back to, to energy. So, Marcelo, um, can you talk a little bit about, I, I think, that how do we unlock the sort of entrepreneurial energy, particularly from private players? I mean, we know that all of this is going to have to be public-private collaborations. But in that context, what do you see as the, the role that private players can play to support overcoming the energy sector challenges, particularly, I think, 
of developing countries. You know, what, are the, what do you see as the key unlocks for scale in the energy transition in the developing world to provide energy access? And what is the role of the private sector players in providing that? You need an Oscar to respond to that, that question, <laughs> but let me, let me go. First of all, we have more or less 50 years, five zero, of experience in privatization in our companies, not 50 years. We, we saw a lot of situations and always privates are faster. This is the first. Private are faster. The second issue, uh, when you have a dialogue with the authority, this is the public relation because a concessionary in the service public is finally the government. If you don't do very well your service, you get take out of the concession. Then you need as a private to convince the concessionary to do it very well. That's the second issue. You need to make a dialogue, not only with the authority, to do it very well, also with the people, and this is community. Then the private could understand better the sensor, talk with the governments, please put incentive to us to do faster because we are faster as a definition. And finally, in this profit sharing mechanism, we need to involve the community because the community finally allows to us to make the progress. Huh? The three things, let's go to one example, faster. We develop and then we manage every year 60 pentabytes of information. Six zero pentabytes is a lot, huh? believe me, it's a lot. And this information, if you go to the public system, bureaucratic, we can manage very well and say, this is the best due to the operation, this is the worst way to lose the control losses, and we can promote also the investment on this. Then finally, the second issue to you, and finally your question, is when you make an uh, economic of a scale acquisition of this uh, data, you can also project what is better to the people. Then private needs also velocity, but dialogue with the authority and also community talk just to improve them. This is more or less, yeah. Thank you. Rodrigo, um, I was lucky enough to be in Seattle a couple of weeks ago for the Breakthrough Energy Summit. And it was quite exciting to see the, 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 the range of catalytic, you know, new tech startups, the energy, you know, the entrepreneurship that, that's happening there, which gives me some hope. But also, I heard John Kerry say, and I, I, I agree with this in, in, in many ways, um, we have to stop talking about the climate crisis and we have to start acting as if it's a climate crisis. So assuming companies take that to heart and they really start you know, taking the action, investing in, addressing climate, the climate emergency, the climate crisis at the speed and scale required, do you see any issues? Do you have any concerns around the limitations that may then, they may then be faced with? And it, you know, can any one company decide to do that alone, a steel company, a shipping company, you know, an airline? Right, yes. So uh, that's a very interesting and very important point because indeed um, we, 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 we work with some, some large players in the infrastructure market. Um, we can think about, I can give you some examples. We can talk about railway uh, infrastructure. For instance, in the UK, uh, you know, AGS2, um, NPR, or TRU, which are, uh, you know, railway infrastructure programs, uh, part of network rail. So they want to integrate all the data uh, in, a, in a platform where they can uh, exchange uh, all the information among different stakeholders, different um, um, disciplines, different life cycle stages, because that kind of infrastructure will stay here for, you know, how many decades will be here. Um, so it's really challenging uh, to manage all this and, and think that one single player will be able to address these kinds of challenges. So if they want to manage carbon, for instance, to decide on an infrastructure that wants to, you know, to be carbon efficient, to build and to design in, a, in an efficient way, well, we have tools, there are available tools in the market that can address some of these challenges. But these types of, of, uh, of they, this industry, they work, they work with many different providers, many different vendors. We don't aim to, to, to have the monopoly of, of uh, infrastructure, uh, particularly if you're, you know, if you're working on the client side and the user side. You really need to put everything together on a single view of truth, aggregate all the data, and be able to manage and share and collaborate and, and review all together. So what we think is that we really need ecosystem collaboration. We, you need to be able to, to, to have something that you can uh, built together uh, to have uh, should be um, should be built on a foundation of open technology, so that you don't be locked in in a specific vendor. So that's why we we are really uh, you know we, we really put this in as important strategy for us uh, um, that that we feel that 
uh, when we talk about infrastructure, we need to talk about uh, infrastructure platform so that we can work yeah. together. That's really important for us. At the World Economic Forum, we like platforms, bringing different pieces together. But I think it's clear, I mean, from what you're saying, no one company, no one steel company, airline, chip, could get there on their own. We're going to need to see an unprecedented level of collaboration, not just public-private collaboration, oh, that's a given, but collaboration within sectors, across sectors, you know, up and down the value chains. I mean, that's, that's going to be essential. So maybe, Michael, in that context, if I could turn to you, how is Emerson fostering collaboration across the, the multitude of stakeholders to drive progress towards a net zero 2050 world? Well, I, you know, I think, first of all, what we're all doing here is we're, we're participating in the discussion, right? That collaboration, Anthony, across all those different types of parties. You know, we need to be here. We need to be having the discussion. We need to challenge ourselves. We need to also take a little satisfaction in progress being made year to year and, and, and project by project. We've worked with a couple of the, the new to the world companies. Uh, Pure Cycle is one that's doing polypropylene recycling, getting it back to a clear pellet. We're working in the lithium recovery space right now, working with Biotech one of those hydrogen startup companies. You know, being around them in the automation context is interesting in one way, but it's also interesting to watch these companies figure out how, how they're gonna get across the chasm and get, yeah. to, get to a place, right? And that's where we need the, the public side to be helping us with simple things like permitting and, and maybe some funding and maybe some incentives, you know, that, that can get that kick started. That might attract the finance. They need to come into the dialogue. Of course, they, we want the best technology providers, and they ultimately need customers with some kind of an economic, you know, value that'll uh, sustain those companies. So, I think making sure that we identify and amplify, the, I think those interesting things that we anticipate to be in the roadmaps for the future, we all have to nurture them together somehow to make them happen. Thank you, um, Raquel. So, in, in that context of this, this you know, need for collaboration. Could you talk a little bit about, I think, that sort of international collaboration, particularly with the, the Global South? Um, you know, what additional support is required for countries and regions like yours? Um, what additional support is required for countries from regions like ours? Yes. Um, I want to make sure I got it right. Pardon? I said I want to make sure I've gotten the right question. Yes. What, what additional support is required, if, if any? Um, would you see it is required to sort of really drive, you know, energy and industrial decarbonization in countries like yours, your region? Sure. I think for us, you know, we, we have as many solutions as we need. And I'm not saying that we don't need any new solutions. We have a lot of new solutions. Um, we have, uh, we're working with a company called CRDC out of Costa Rica that has turned plastic waste into a resin that we are now um, adding to uh, concrete to strengthen it, which enhances our built environment, which is what we need to prepare ourselves against the storms that are coming. Um, we're working with uh, on young entrepreneurs who provide um, transformation of sargassum, the seaweed that is growing now because of the warming of the ocean, and turning that into fertilizer. And so we're seeing lots of new solutions. And we look a lot to Uplink from World Economic Forum, you know, to see what's happening there and to see what new solutions are available. Um, one of the things that we need is a highlight of our solution. So for example, Bermuda, which is one of the countries in our region, they have solved water security. They, each house collects its own water and it, it does its thing with the water and, and everybody provide, everybody's water secure in Bermuda. And, and we have um, Barbados, they have solar water heaters on almost every roof. And so we figured out some things. We need greater collaboration in the region to figure out how we grow those centers of excellence. We need new solutions from external to the region. And then we need the solutions that we have exported to the rest of the region so that we can participate. I love the, the last speaker who talked about this is a massive economic opportunity and we cannot be left behind. We cannot be the, the sort of um, ones on the front lines not taking, not participating in the economic opportunity. Thank you. Rebecca, if I could turn to you. Um, we don't live in two different worlds, one called, you know, industry and energy and one, one called nature. I mean, this is the same world, you know, it's the same system. And we often act and talk and get into silos as if we do. So, based on the fact that most of our economic activity depends on us having, you know, a natural system there to underpin it, 
what is the role of, of data in bringing these two together? So those industrial companies that are actually investing in nature-based solutions at the same time as they make commitments and invest in, in net zero decarbonization, how does data link those two and make it clear that it's not an either or, it is both? So I think data has been a tool to make companies, countries accountable. And what we need to do is broaden that data set of what they are accountable for. Because what I think the decarbonization movement has shown is that once there is a clear metric, and once you have held countries and companies and individuals accountable for their usage of that natural resource, you can actually inspire a world of innovation, financing, direction, and motivation to address that challenge. The, the problem we have with decarbonization is it's just singular, it's focusing on CO2. In order to bridge these worlds, we need to expand the data set to be looking at our natural resource consumption. I mean, great that we're electrifying things, but lithium, cobalt, all of this has an impact on the, on the natural world and natural resources. So we need to expand how we look at our natural resources, water, soil erosion, et cetera, expand that data set for all of us to focus on so that we can stimulate the same type of focus that we see here today on decarbonization on natural resource management. Thank you. I'm going to come to the audience in a moment, but if I was a, if I was a game show host, this would be the point where I have the bonus question for whoever's quickest off the, off the mic. And my bonus question for 100 points, we, we've got a plethora of data emerging, which is fantastic. But, you know, in, in all economic activity, there's a plethora of data. And if you do not have a common framework, methodologies, standards, within which that data exists and is reported, you know, the risk is you simply get overwhelmed. Just imagine if we had, you know, it's bad enough having two global accounting standards for financial reporting, but if we had 50, 30, 40, <sighs> That's a danger, isn't it, at the moment? Many different companies are developing their own methodologies and standards for their carbon footprint. There is no common standard for measuring carbon through a value chain. You know, you have a car company at the moment that wants to report on the embedded carbon in that car, probably has to deal with, you know, different accounting standards for the, each material it buys from different sectors, and sometimes from different steel companies. Even if it's buying steel, each steel company will have its own framework and methodology which creates huge inefficiencies and barriers. So how important is it that, as well as developing the data and bringing the data together, we do the work now to develop the common framework standards and methodologies within which we can report this data? Go on, Matt. you were fastest off the mark. Yeah, no, I, uh, because this, uh, this totally relates with what I was just saying about ecosystem collaboration, right? So just two days ago or three days ago, we announced uh, uh, a new partnership in an integration with, with a, with a not-for-profit organization called Building Transparency. So basically they are, uh, they have a tool for carbon, uh, carbon reporting and carbon data, so collecting EPDs, environmental product declarations from, from you know, from products that the, you can then use for, for carbon uh, infrastructure. So the point is that this organization is now supported by multiple entities, multiple players around the world, uh, you know, uh, that are already working on infrastructure. So each company can develop their own tool. We, as a, as a software development company for infrastructure, we can, all, we can develop our own carbon tool. We can do it. It's easier for us if you get our software developers to put together and, and do. And, and so, but that's not the, the challenge here. The challenge is to try to build an ecosystem of partnership where, where you can work with someone else that is already a big player uh, in this uh, aspect. So they are already providing uh, carbon insights uh, around infrastructure for many different uh, companies and infrastructure around the world. So instead of building your own tools, you'd, you really need to find ways of partnering or supporting uh, organizations. So, so you create this, you know, this, these groups. This is our view. For us, this is really strategic. We made this decision right. some months ago, uh, and we are really happy with it. Angie, can I jump in there? Go, go As a man it. with 591 million metric tons of scope three, um, we published that for the first time this year, a complete footprint. And I can tell you, the work to even get to that was amazing. The data doesn't exist. Some data exists. A lot of modeling. Um, you know, I think sector by, we've got to break it down somehow and go work on it. Steel's a great example. 
we have a lot of products that go into the HVAC refrigeration space, right? It's one of the big energy users in the built environments around the world. You know, I've judged that our lifetime of our products, because you have to put a lifetime of emissions into the scope three calculation, is 15 years. My customers might be saying 10 or 20 or 14. I don't know what they're saying. We're, you know, we're not, we need to work through those aligning activities. I'm going to suggest sector by sector first, and then ultimately maybe there's some measures that, that pop out at the top. The other piece of the puzzle is the people in our companies. We have 86,000 people. We've got to get them fluent. It is take, takes time. It takes time to get people fluent. We're working it. We've been working it hard. You know, I think we're, you know, we've identified some things to work on in the meantime, which is yeah. good. That's what you want to use the data for. So just to kind of bring a little bit of a perspective on that. Brilliant. And if I could just be devil's advocate here, you know, I agree, we need to, we need to establish standards and, and we need to support organizations that already have developed these standards so that we're feeding into what's already taking place. But what we're seeing a lot of, you know, and, and hopefully this is why I'm a part of the conversation, is we're seeing a lot of the standards being established in the global north, which is where all the carbon is coming from. And so if we think about capacity building in a little bit of a different way and provide opportunities for solutions from the global south, to be able to be these standards or to be able to establish these methods of, of, of harnessing this data. It allows us to build capacity and it also, you know, we'd have less of a conversation around loss and damage, for example, if we are looking at opportunities to build capacity and to create revenue streams in other parts of the world. If I, I would say this is a more, um, let me say, informal question, no? I was, it's not prepared, I would say, no? Uh, it's very important to hear others, uh, and I'm going to explain why. We, as, as a group, uh, hear a lot of people. We have more than 10,000 startups proposing two things every day, young people in Israel, in New York, in uh, Sao Paulo, that 10,000 people saying to you how to do it better, because we are not the best, but the people are the best. This is the second, and when we buy our components, we buy more or less seven, eight billion euros per year of TOTEX. TOTEX is CAPES and OPEX, no? We ask for the people, that was the idea for young people, the index of reduction of emission. Then they present the bidders. When they put transformer lines, cable, interrupters, they present the carbon print, how they reduce, how many uh, recycling companies they have, how many people in a fair way they are, so, People are bidding today with all these sustainable index. That's about innovation, sustainable. And always we get a good price. That is the, the, the interesting thing. It's not more, more, it's less. Then always less. No? This is two ideas that I can share with my colleagues here. People telling to us how to do it. And after that, asking to the providers how to recycle better. Then that's it. Can I just jump in at the end to build on what Raquel was saying? I think before we hit that convergence of ways to look at this, that inclusiveness of other voices is so critical because in all of our projects, when we plant trees around the world, anyone in that community would not say that carbon sequestration is the most valuable part of planting that tree. It is the shade. It is the stabilization of a riverbank. Yeah. And until we have a little bit more how communities in need value and appreciate this whole effort uh, that we're making, I don't think we're gonna converge on a, on a platform and a set of standards and metrics that are gonna be as useful as they need to, de need to be to drive a global agenda. Thank you. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so if you do have a question, don't feel shy. Please do come forward. Um, okay. <laughs> It's a shy group. People were uh, a bit sleepy this morning. They're obviously sleepy after such a good lunch today. Oh, we have one. Brilliant. I'm glad someone is paying attention. I can't see. It's a little bit dark over there. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for this amazing panel. It was very informative. Could you stand up, please? Just introduce yourself and your company or your affiliation. Um, hi. So I'm from uh, Switzerland, and uh, we're into nuclear energy. <laughs> we're into nuclear uh, energy. So, uh, well, that was not very important, but what I'm trying to get at is how do you think uh, this uh, data digitalization might help for uh, improving carbon trading schemes? Because I'm a bit uh, worried that this carbon trading thing is becoming too much of greenwashing, and uh, I'm not quite sure this is the right direction we are getting into. 
So this is, this is a question around carbon trading and offsetting. Um, and but think, using... Pardon? Using more digitalization and looking at uh, supply chain, for example. So it's a bit difficult to hear, but I think it's the robustness of carbon trading and whether it really delivers the climate benefits um, that it claims. And that, she said that using the data, using the data to... to and using the data. Right. So how can the data yeah. really help us ensure that if we have a carbon market, it is really credible and it is truly delivering the benefits. And in a sense, I think this is, this is a really important question because, you know, as we work with companies who are committing to net zero and the mitigation pathways, what is the role of carbon credits? Is it, you know, as many claim that it, it lets them off the hook, they buy much cheaper carbon credits, they do not have to invest in the mitigation? Or do we create a system that actually incentivizes them to, to deliver on that mitigation. And we talked a little bit about this in the panel this morning, as opposed to just net zero, net positive. So net positive, where you are decarbonizing and you're committed to that pathway and investing in that. At the same time, you're going beyond that to invest in further emissions reductions. Who wants to, this is not an easy question, but who wants to uh, tackle this? Um, we struggle with it often because we have to look at the companies who are investing in our projects and is this part of a, a greenwashing initiative? Do they have serious commitments of their own to decarbonize? What is our role as a project developer in that, in that process? Which is why we have focused so much on data and transparency, not just on our projects, but also who our customers are and how they're getting funded and what, how it's connected to their, to the, their strategies. And I think it needs to be an and. I get a little nervous when there's criticisms about you know, offsetting because it is great that we are decarbonizing, but all of the science shows it's insufficient, right? We also need to reverse land degradation and yeah. other sort of um, deterioration of our environment in order for our societies and economies to be successful. So it, it does need to be an and and. So we need to be highly critical. Transparency and data can help us with that to maintain the quality. Um, but it needs to be both paths. I mean, isn't there, I mean, again, really important question. I mean, and, and I think I like that, it's the and, and. So isn't there a hierarchy? I mean, as we entered into this 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, carbon neutrality was a great entry point. Yeah. Great. But that's no longer good enough. I think the bare minimum now has to be net zero. But almost now we have to be pushing the boundaries to net positive. So in a sense, it's net zero plus the offsetting, it's not either or. So if you're, if you're committed to that net zero pathway and you're offsetting your emissions profile as you get there, that's gotta be a win-win, hasn't it? It sounds lovely and we want that to happen. We're, we're still struggling with net zero, right? Well, <laughs> We have to actually, you know, nice ambitions, nice targets, we have to have, make it happen now, right? But we have to keep pushing the boundary, don't we? Because if you're doing that pushing the boundaries are and you're investing in those emission reductions, yeah. you're buying us more time. But yeah. we've got to make that link back to the carbon budget. I mean, it's all about the carbon budget and staying within the carbon budget. Yeah. So in our again, our net zero design is, you know, we follow the SBTI standard, 90% absolute yeah. reductions. And in the spaces we we're at, where I buy steel, I buy plastics, I buy electronics, and then we put them in use, it needs a lot of electricity. You know, I am depending on so many others to pull their weight in the system. You know, yeah. we're, we're having to push and we're having to pull at the same time. Yeah, oh, what? Uh, can, oh. Okay. So quickly, we've got time for one more very quick question because we're right on the red line. Sorry, if we can have the question here at the front. If you can make it quick, um, so name, affiliation, quick question. Uh, Mustafa Sherwini, I'm leader of uh, initiative, uh, this uh, the leader initiative and pioneer initiative in, uh, in Arab uh, country and in Africa. This is uh, called uh, uh, Climate Ambassadors. We have about 5,000 climate ambassadors from African and Egypt and the Arab world. Uh, my question, uh, do you know the population about uh, 7 million of the world? Uh, I know uh, about uh, four uh, mil million, point seven, four point seven million person use internet daily. Uh, for uh, uh, two, uh, two and a half an hour. It's right. About four point seven million people use internet daily 
to uh, uh, to our and the half. Do you know the digital carbon footprint for each minute for the person produce four gram of uh, carbon? How we? How, what is the imagine in the future after ten years? So is this, so this is a car, so, so, so this is a carbon footprint carbon footprint of the global internet so of digitalization yes so so can we is, is that your question so the question what we can do after 10 years when the carbon footprint uh, will be more than uh, 10% of the total carbon fo footprint of the world from only uh, digital carbon footprint. After okay. 10 years, maybe 15% till 10%. Okay, who wants to... And wants how to can... How sorry, can sorry, we're going to we're gonna have to cut it okay. short because we're running out of okay. time. I'd say power using renewables. We have tons of geothermal in the Caribbean. You're welcome to come and use our geothermal to power the, power the data. Yeah, and I think we're seeing the renewables being rolled out. Um, NL is obviously involved in that to... You know, I think the electricity part of this question is not going to be that difficult yeah. compared to some of the molecule things that we're going to have to figure out. So we agree the data is going up fast, the storage, the data center work. There's growth in that. We're going to have to offset that. We've got to work yeah. on that. And, and many, of the, many of the companies that are investing in direct renewable energy supply, which yeah. is, is critical. Exactly. But we've, you've got to make, you know, that's got to continue at a pace. That's right. Brilliant. Thank you so much. This has been an amazing panel. Really enjoyed the conversation. Um, thank you for bearing with me for stepping in uh, at the last minute, but I've, I've really enjoyed this and actually learnt a lot. So if you can please thank our panel. <laughs>